Hello, everybody, and welcome to this event from the IFS and the Health Foundation. Um, today, we're going to be looking at the proposed changes to the social care cap. <clears throat> I'm delighted um, to be joined today by authors of the new report that accompanies this event. That's um, David Sturrock, Senior Research Economist at the IFS, and Charles Tallock, the Assistant Director of the Real Centre at the Health Foundation. They're going to be describing the analysis that they've been doing together, looking at the proposed changes to the CAP. <clears throat> and then we're going to have a discussion and a response from Sir Andrew Dillnott to establish the principle of the CAP in the first place, and um, Anna Dixon, who is Chair of the Commission on Reimagining Care for the um, Archbishops of Canterbury and York, and the author of The Age of Aging Better. So the context for um, today's event is that obviously it's over a decade now since Sir Andrew Dillnock did his uh, seminal review of the funding of social care and established the principle that the important market failure and the key, one of the key priorities in relation to funding for the state was to protect people from catastrophic costs. And that review proposed a cap on care. Well, it took 10 years, but in the autumn of 2021, um, the government um, accepted the principle of the cap, introduced the new levy for NHS and uh, social care. Uh, and, and that looked, uh, I guess, very promising after many false dawns, not least in the 2014 Care Act. But what we now see is that whilst the principle of the cap is very important, the detail of the level you set the cap at and the way you design the cap really matters. So we know that the cap is being set at £86,000, um, which is higher than the original deal lot recommendations. But the amendment that the government has tabled uh, proposes further changes that vary um, the, uh, this new system from the model set out by Andrew Dillon in his report. Um, and today what we're going to do is look at how the details um, of the current government's proposals in relation to establishing a capital care, how they affect who is protected and by how much they're protected. And this is really important because a lot of the debate about social care has been about whether or not we can devise funding systems and a funding reform package that is fair. Now, there are very many different interpretations of fairness, <clears throat> and philosophers could have a field day over this. <clears throat> but one of the issues, which obviously the IFS uh, looks at a lot, is the distributional aspects of, uh, of that. So um, are different groups in society protected to different degrees? And we're going to focus on that in this um, analysis. The way we're going to run the event is that um, first Charles and then David are going to present and talk about findings, and then Andrew and then Anna are going to respond to that. I'm going to go out and they're going to hand over to each other um, as they go through and that will take the first 30 minutes. And then I'll come back in and chair a Q&A session. You should all have access to Slido. And please, 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 can you put your questions on Slido because I'll be looking at that and I'll be grouping your questions together and using those to, to pose to the uh, panelists today. So I hope you enjoyed today's um, discussion and presentations. Um, <clears throat> do look at the report as well. It's an outstanding piece of uh, analysis and um, I'll hand over now to Charles. Hello, everyone. So David and I are going to be talking about the impact of what seems like just a technical amendment to the CARE Act, um, which will affect the way that people meet it towards the new £86,000 cap on care costs. But before we get into that, um, I thought we should just zoom out and look at how this fits into the wider social care system and the funding 
and reforms that are needed. So the cap on care costs is an important reform to make the social care fairer and work better for people who currently pay their own for their own care. But the cap is one element of a wider means tested system. And I think it's useful to just look at that. So this chart um, shows social care spending since 2010 11. Um, so that's the, the red line. Um, in essence, this is the spend on the current means tested system. That's the system which exists to ensure that those who need care and support who can't pay for themselves get the care they need. So as you'll see from that red line, um, the level in 2021 is pretty much where it was in 2010-11. However, over that period, the population's grown and it's also aged. So what we've done on this chart is also the um, yellow line is the per person spend and the teal line is the age adjusted um, spend per capita. And as you can see, if you look at the bottom line, the age adjusted spend per capita, funding now is around 10 to 15 percent lower in real terms than in 2010-11. And that creates all sorts of problems with access to social care and the quality of care, including problems associated with workforce. As you'll see from the dotted lines, this is um, the outlook given the spending review. The spending review settlement doesn't do much to improve the situation. Um, there was obviously the big announcement about the money put in for the reform, but if you look at the money that's available through councils um, for the current social care system, um, spending power for local authorities increases by about 2% in real terms, but that isn't actually enough to meet what um, our pressures, demand pressures of around 3.5%. And that, of course, is before we make any inroads into unmet need. So for the social care system to work for those needing care, more money is needed. But aside from the, the funding of the current system, there's another fundamental problem with the way that social care is funded. And this is probably a familiar picture for those of you who have um, been around over the last 10 years and, and followed the debate. So this is, this is um, the DHSC's latest version of the costs that an ad, a, someone aged 65 faces, the lifetime costs of social care. Um, the blue section there shows the, that about one in seven people aged over 65 will face um, care costs over the remainder of their lifetime of over 100,000. And if you don't qualify for means test support, you will have to pay for those costs yourself. Consequences of that are that people really are unable to plan and prepare. There's a huge amount of uncertainty and the possibility of very, very high costs. And the only response really in that situation is either to disengage. And obviously we do see quite a lot of people disengaging from the social care system, sticking their heads in the sand, or you can save as much as possible to prepare for the worst. And you might do that rather than spending on improving your well-being or investing in things which might prevent your later care need. That is the problem that the Dillnot um, Commission, which reported on in 2011, came up with a solution to. And this is their solution, which is basically to have a cap on care costs. And I've shown it here on this diagram as £86,000. And that would significantly reduce people's exposures to high costs. In effect, what this is, is a social insurance with an excess set at 86000 So. Since 2011, when the Dilnock Commission um, made its recommendations, there have been twists and turns in the road and there's been a policy evolution. So this is how the different policy iterations compare. So we had the Dilnock Commission, which proposed a cap of between 25 and 50,000. It made a central recommendation of 35,000. It set the um, upper capital limit of to 100,000, so that below 100,000, you would qualify some, some for below 100,000 pounds worth of assets, you'd qualify for some means tested support. Um, and it set what's called daily living costs to 190 pounds per week. Those are the amounts that people would be expected to pay for um, their care, just as they would expect to contribute to, to living costs where they're living in their own home. We then had the, um, those were all parameters for a system which was going to be introduced in, or it was proposed was introduced in 2011. In practice, it wouldn't be introduced then, but those parameters were for that system were introduced then. Then we had the Care Act 2014 and the proposals which were 
going to be implemented in April 2016. That set a cap of 72,000, set a um, up to capital of 118,000 um, and various other parameters, not too different from the Dillnock Commission. And then we've had the latest set of proposals, which set an 86,000 pound cap starting from October 2023. 20, um, 100,000 limit, um, upper capital limit for residential and domiciliary care. So I have put these into a common language, which is basically what would the Dillnock Commission parameters and the 2016 parameters look like if they were introduced in October 2023, as the latest set of proposals are going to be. And I've marked them for ease of reference with a red meaning it's worse than the Dillnock Commission, green for it's better, um, and yellow arrow for it's pretty much the same. So as you can see, and sorry, I should say that in all these, we, the, the things have been upgraded, not just in line with um, inflation, but in line with what um, the Dillnock Commission said should, the parameters should rise each year in line with the basic state pension. And the CARE Act proposal said the cap should rise in line with earnings. And actually in the impact assessment, then they, they assumed that every, all the parameters raised in line was line with earnings, which means that it's kind of in step, the whole system remains quite symmetrical. So that's what I've done. I've raised them in, in accordance with what the Dillnock Commission recommendations were, but also what the impact assessment produced in 2015 said. So the cap is of 86,000. In the CARE Act, the 2016 proposals and the 2021 proposals are actually very similar. If you uprated the 2016 proposals to 2023, you get 86,000. That's worse than the Dillnock Commission, worse on um, the highest cap of 71,000. Um, the upper capital limit for residential care, 100,000. Dillnock Commission and Care Act would be about 140,000 in 2023. Um, the capital limit for domiciliary care. So at the moment, um, the um, domiciliary care, um, the under the Dillnock Commission, domiciliary care upper capital limit would be um, lower, reflecting the fact that housing assets aren't included in the means test. The latest proposals raise that to 100,000. That's a big increase in generosity. The lower capital limit, very, very similar, no difference across them. And then the contributions towards daily living costs, the latest proposals, 2021 proposals, are more generous than the Dillnock Commission and the 2016 um, proposals, which were for 270, would now be 270 pounds a week, the latest proposal 200 pounds a week. And then finally, looking at younger adults, quite a lot of the debate is around older people, but younger adults are a really, really important group for social care. Half of the spending is on younger adults. Dillnock Commission proposed that there should be a zero cap, in effect, free care for people who enter adulthood with care needs or develop care needs up to the age of 40. The CARE Act 2014, or at least the 2016 version of that, basically said that people who were either had developed care needs under the age of 25 or enter adulthood with a care need would have a zero cap. However, the 2021 proposals treat adult, younger adults, adults of working age, in exactly the same way as older people. So their cap would also be 86,000. That's significantly worse. So the other big change is in how costs towards the care act, kept, kept to, towards the cap are um, metered. So this chart shows the accumulated care costs by week for someone with say residential care needs costing 500 pounds a week. So that slope goes up by 500 pounds a week. As you can see, after 172 weeks, that adds up to 86,000 pounds. That under the Dillnock Commission proposals and under the 2016 proposals is when the cap would be met. However, for people with under £100,000 of assets, so I'm assuming in this case, this is someone with £100,000 worth of assets entering residential care, there would be a contribution from the state to their care costs under the, under the means test, and that's where the £100,000 upper, upper capital limit comes in. So the individual would contribute, but so would the state. And it's the individual's contribution that the latest set of proposals um, count towards the cap. So in this example, under the D 
still not commissioned or 2016 proposals, the cap would be met at 172 weeks. By that time, under these, um, under the latest proposals, the individual contribution would have only reached about 40,000. So actually would carry on contributing until, until they hit the cap. Um, and in this case, they would never actually hit the cap. So what's the rationale for the different approaches? So I've kind of set out here that I've, I've taken from, gone through the documents and, and looked at what the explanation was. So the Dillnock Commission was, had a whole section on how you should monitor measure spend. Um, it came down firmly on the side of measuring or counting what they called notional spend, which is basically accumulated care costs. And the rationale there was they said that excluding state contributions to the meter would make the system unfair for those on low incomes. 2016 plans actually came to a similar conclusion. They said that um, the, if you look at the total costs to the, to, um, of meeting a person's needs towards the cap, that would mean that people meet it towards the cap at the same rate, irrespective of the state support they're receiving. And the 2021 proposals obviously changed that, and that's what we're talking about today. And their logic was that it should be individual contributions towards the cap on care costs that count, because otherwise people would reach the cap at an artificially faster rate than what they contribute. So what about an assessment of the impact of that? Well, in January, DHSC published an impact assessment and they included the costs um, of the whole package of reforms um, compared to the current system. This is a summary of the costs. Um, there were in the light green on here are some costs to, for provider market reforms that were also included. I'm not gonna go into those. The, the key things are the gray at the bottom, which is the cost for older people. The pink is the um, cost for adults um, under 65 and the purple is the assessment costs. There would be an increase in assessment costs because people who are currently self-funders would be coming forward to have their care needs assessed. Um, as you can see, the costs rise quite quickly up to about 27, 28, 28, 29. And that's because people are um, not yet hitting the cap in the early stages, but then start to hit the cap after three or so years. Um, and then after that, they rise um, in, a, in a similar kind of rate of growth after that. If you, can, if you look at the costs of the um, charging reform, so that's the bit excluding the provider market reforms, that is about 12% of the um, current system. So these reforms, the, the cap and the extended means test add around 12% to the cost of the current system. Um, and finally, though, the impact assessment didn't cover the impact of the amendment itself. What it did is it compared um, the total package of reforms with the 86,000 pound cap, the means test reforms, and the new way of metering with the current system. However, what's really needed is this is a change for primary legislation is a comparison of the amended system with the um, same set of reforms without that amendment. In other words, people metering towards the cap in the way that um, was um, originally envisaged. And this in fact is what um, Mel Stride MP, who's chair of the Treasury Committee, asked Richie Sunak for on 18th of November. I've underlined a bit. He was pretty clear that what was needed was an um, analysis of the impact of the reforms against a base case with no change to the CARE Act, but implementation of the other reforms. And at this point, I'm going to hand over um, to David, because I think that neatly takes us then into um, what David's going to say. So hang on, I'm just going to stop sharing. Great, thanks very much, Charles. Okay, so as Charles has set up, uh, I'm now gonna talk through our analysis, which is assessing the impact of this amendment proposed by the government to the CARE Act. So just to be absolutely crystal clear, what we're comparing here is the new system um, of social care charging, including the new cap and expanded means test against the equivalent system 
Um, but without this amendment, which is being proposed um, to, to the way which people um, meter towards the cap. So it's that uh, component that, that Parliament is, is currently considering that we're looking um, at the impact of. What I'm going to do is, first of all, just set out in a mechanical way, how is it that the amendment affects people uh, depending on their level of assets and income? Now, of course, the effect that someone in the end actually realizes on, in, on their assets as a result of this amendment would depend on what care journey they went through, if any. So if you don't actually end up uh, using any care and incurring any care costs, and of course, this can't make any difference to you. Um, and so we're going to show uh, show our results for uh, how people are affected if they were to go through different sorts of care journeys. But it's really important to bear in mind throughout this that while after the fact, how you are impacted will depend or would depend on what kind of care you use. Of course, even though only a small number of people might incur very large care costs and be affected by this amendment, uh, a much larger group of people, perhaps even everyone, faces some risk of incurring large care costs. And so kind of thinking about things ahead of time, potentially um, a large number of people, if not everyone, um, could be affected by this amendment in terms of the, the change in the protection against the possibility of large care costs and the benefits that that might provide in terms of peace of mind and ability to plan. And it's those uh, benefits that were really uh, the main reasons uh, for, for setting up this cap in the first place. So once I've set out how this amendment would work, uh, or then go on to ask how the amendment is going to affect older people from different groups, thinking about those with different uh, levels of income and wealth. So thinking about the distributional impacts and also thinking about different impacts for those living in different parts of England. So the way in which this amendment would affect people is that it means that those who receive means-tested support towards their care costs uh, would no longer have that count towards their progress towards hitting the new social care cap. What that means is that if you're receiving means-tested support towards your care costs, and as a result of the amendment, it would take you longer to hit the cap, or in fact, you might never hit the cap. I'm just going to illustrate how that would have an impact, thinking about an example here of someone who goes into residential care that costs £700 per week, which is a kind of a typical amount. And I'm going to show for different, um, consider for different levels of income and assets, how long it would take you to hit the cap. Now, without the amendment in place, uh, things are quite simple because you reach the cap according to total spending on you, not what you pay out of your own pocket, then regardless of your level of income or assets, you're going to hit the cap after three years and uh, about three months. However, once the amendment were in place, this would change things so that how long it takes you to hit the cap depends on your level of income and on your levels of assets. So in this dotted line, I'm showing for an example of someone with an annual income of £16,000, which is about average for the older population, how long it would take them to hit the cap, uh, depending on their level of assets. So we can see that for someone with more than about £175,000, because they would never actually draw on any means-tested support before hitting the cap, they wouldn't be affected by the amendment. But for those with lower levels of assets, it's the case that um, how long it takes you to hit the cap will depend on how much wealth you have. The lower, the lower amount of assets you have, the more um, you're going to be supported in terms of mean means-tested support, and therefore the bigger the impact of the amendment on how long it's going to take you to reach the cap, as now you have to um, reach, reach it based on only on what you contribute. So for example, if someone has income of £16,000 per year, they have assets of £100,000, it's going to take them over six years to hit the cap in this uh, scenario. For those who have less than £75,000, it would take them more than a decade. 
Now, if you have higher income, some of that income is going to be going towards your care costs. You were receiving less means tested support. And so the amendment would have a smaller impact on you for a given level of assets. But it could still take you considerably longer to hit the cap than without the amendment. If you've got particularly low levels of asset of, of income, sorry, here an example of eight thousand pounds per year, that it's going to take you uh, longer to hit the cap. In fact, if you have particularly low level of income and assets, then your contributions are, in this example, going to be going only towards meeting your daily living cost charge, which doesn't count towards the cap. And so, in fact, you will never reach the cap under the amended system and you continue having to, to make those, those payments for as long as you um, need care. Now, how does this impact in terms of how long it takes you to hit the cap feed through to how much of people's assets they would have to contribute towards meeting their care costs? I'm going to show one example, first of all, which illustrates the way in which the amendment would reduce protection against catastrophic costs for those with moderate assets and income. So I'm going to show an example of someone who spends a decade in residential care at a cost of £700 per week, so a really kind of worst case scenario. And this person uh, is going to be assumed to have an income of £11,800 uh, per year, which is just going to meet their daily living costs. And just as a reminder, under the existing system without any cap in place, uh, you essentially have to uh, contribute um, all of your assets towards meeting your care costs until you're left um, with a, around uh, £20,000. So that can mean a very large amount of your assets, say up to over 90% of your assets uh, being depleted by meeting your care costs. Under the new system with the cap, and the expanded means tested support, but without the amendment that we we're talking about, there's a significant reduction in how much of assets could be um, depleted by such a scenario. What the amendment does, showed by this dark green line, is to change the system quite substantially in this worst case scenario for those who have assets between about £20,000 and £186,000. For those with higher levels of assets, they would never draw on means-tested support before hitting the cap, so they're unaffected. But for those in between, that means-tested support no longer counts towards the cap. They have to contribute for longer and therefore contribute more overall. And those who are most affected in this scenario are those with £106,000 worth of assets who have to contribute an additional 30% of their initial assets towards meeting their care costs. So quite substantial um, unpicking of the protection um, provided by the cap due to this amendment. Now, this is one particular example, uh, a worst um, case scenario. And here we're showing actually the level of income which produces the kind of biggest impact in terms of additional um, amount of assets that has to be spent on care. So what about thinking about this scenario, but also um, considering other possible levels of income as well as other levels of assets. That's what I'm going to show in this next chart. Overall, we're going to see that across quite a broad range of moderate levels of income, people could still be quite substantially affected by in, in terms of reduction in their protection against this worst case. On the left-hand panel, I'm showing how much of your assets you would have to contribute towards meeting your care under this decade in residential care in the system without the amendment. And I'm showing this now for different combinations of assets along the top, but also now different levels of income uh, down the side. So here, for example, we can see that for someone who has annual income of 15,000 pounds and 100,000 pounds in assets, they would have to contribute 40% of their assets towards meeting their care costs without the amendment. That rises to 63% as a result of the amendment. And on the right-hand side, showing the difference, an increase of 23% of those initial assets. Now, highlighted in yellow, we see that worst case scenario, which I showed in the previous chart. But if we look across a broader range of income levels, we can still see pretty substantial impacts of the amendment for those who have moderate levels of assets. 
Now, this is one particular worst case scenario. In our analysis, we've looked at a range of different uh, care cost scenarios that people might face in different care journeys. So here I'm showing um, the effect of the amendment for now for uh, a different, a different uh, range of care scenarios. In the top left, I'm showing the 10 years in residential care that we just talked through. On the top right, I'm now showing 10 years spent in high intensity domiciliary care, which is assumed to cost 500 pounds per week. Here, um, we see that there's kind of more moderate effects, but these are actually largest for those with slightly higher wealth. Now, a reason for that is that when you're receiving domiciliary care, your housing assets aren't chargeable. And we're assuming here that three quarters of people's wealth is held in housing, which is typical for those at older ages. Um, so that means that those who have higher levels of wealth, who actually have a more moderate amount of non-housing wealth, are the ones who are going to be eligible for means tested support and most affected, although that effect isn't so large compared to their overall amounts of wealth. Um, but if we look down at the uh, two panels at the bottom here, then what I'm showing now is a uh, two care journey scenarios which mix both uh, domiciliary care and residential care. So on the left, we're imagining someone who spends five years in medium intensity domiciliary care, assumed to cost 250 pounds per week, uh, followed by then five years in residential care. And on the right-hand side, two and a half years in both. Now, what you uh, might notice from this is that there is a actually a particularly large effect of the reform for someone experiencing a combination um, of domiciliary and residential care. And these effects extend further up in terms of those with higher levels of wealth. So why is that? Well, when you're in domiciliary care, as I've said, you would be uh, potentially receiving means-tested support or a larger group of people might be receiving means-tested support because only their non-housing assets are chargeable. What that means is that without the amendment, you might make significant progress towards the cap due to means-tested support. Um, when you're in domiciliary care um, and get quite close to hitting the cap. But with the amendment, you don't make anywhere near as much progress towards the cap. Now, when you then move into residential care, subsequently, your housing assets become chargeable. If you've still got a long way to go towards hitting the cap, you're going to have to make substantial contributions from your housing wealth towards um, uh, before you hit the cap. And overall, there's a much larger impact. Um, of the amendment. In fact, this is lot, even though the overall cost of this journey is not as great as 10 years spent in residential care, the effect in, of the amendment on the assets you have to contribute is, is larger. Now here in these examples, we've been showing some care journeys that uh, are, are quite uh, going for quite a long time. Now, um, it is the case and it's worth bearing in mind um, that you do have to undergo uh, a care journey of a significant length before you would be affected by the amendment. The reason being that if you wouldn't have hit the cap anyway without the amendment, then um, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference to you. Um, but just by, by way of, of reference, um, to compare the, the length of these journeys, what we do know about those going into residential care is that about a quarter of people spend um, about three and a half years or more in residential care and one in 10 spend um, more than six years in residential care. So there's significant risks of long journeys. And one final point to note when we're thinking about the potential for particularly uh, long uh, journeys, long amounts of time spent in receipt of care, is that of course those who are of working age and receiving care might be particularly likely to have um, longer periods and uh, many years spent receiving care and therefore might be particularly affected by the amendment and having to pay, for example, contributions out of their income for many more years as a result of the amendment. So now I just want to come on and say then, what does this amendment mean in terms of the effect of uh, its effects on uh, different groups of older people in the population? So the way that we're going to get at how the effect 
uh, the, the amendment affects older people in different groups is to use some data on the wealth and the incomes and the household characteristics of the 65 and older population in England from a survey called the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. And we're going to imagine the following thought experiment. What if everyone were to, in that older population, were to start a particular care journey tomorrow? How much of their wealth would be depleted um, as a result? Now, we're not saying that this is a likely scenario. It's not a forecast. What it's intended to do is to illustrate which sorts of people would be protected to what extent from uh, these different scenarios and who would be most affected by the amendment in terms of their protection against the risk that they face these care journeys. And we're going to look at how people are affected depending on their different levels of wealth and income and those who are in different parts of the country. So just to kind of set the scene and get an idea of what levels of wealth and income are like across the elderly population, here I'm showing some percentile cutoffs for income, household income per person for the 65 and older population. So we see that, for example, about a fifth of older people have income per person of less than £11,200. 40% have less than about £14,700. If we look at those who have some difficulties with activities of daily living, who might be more likely to need care in the, in the nearer future, then those levels are slightly lower, but kind of broadly uh, in line. If we look at wealth, then we can see wealth per person um, in the older, uh, the 65 and older population is such that a fifth of people have less than £83,000 and 40% of people have less than £183,000 um, of wealth per person. And so we can kind of already start to think about how many people in, in, in what part of the distribution might be affected when we remember what sorts of levels of wealth of a kind of around you know, 50 to 150,000 pounds or so that are most affected by the amendment under a range of scenarios. So here um, in uh, this chart, I'm showing now an equivalent comparison of protection against that 10 years spent in residential care both without and with the amendment, and on the right-hand side, the difference between the two. But now I'm looking at quintiles, that's fifths of the income distribution and the asset distribution. So uh, each square here is showing one combination of these quintiles of income and uh, wealth per person. And what this shows us is that looking at the right-hand side, highlighted in this yellow box, is those who are in the second wealth quintile and who have income which is in the second or third quintile. So those kind of towards the lower half with moderate levels of assets and income who would be most affected, in this case, um, having to contribute an additional 12% of their assets towards meeting their care costs in this worst case scenario. We can also compare and look across the, the range of scenarios that we are illustrating that I've uh, discussed already. Doing that, we see there's a kind of consistent picture in terms of which wealth quintile is most affected. Um, for for, all, for well, three of these scenarios, the second wealth quintile is most affected. The third is also somewhat affected and slightly more affected for the, the two and a half years domiciliary, two and a half years residential scenario. But what we're seeing is it's kind of those to uh, the lower half, not right at the bottom, but in the lower half of the distribution who are most affected under a range of these different scenarios in terms of the reduction of their protection against these worst, uh, some of these worst case scenarios, uh, these long um, stays um, in care. Now, finally, just want to think about the regional dimension here. Uh, as might be well, well known to, to many of you, uh, levels of wealth vary substantially across the country. Of course, levels of wealth vary within different regions, but there are big differences across regions too. So here I'm showing average levels of wealth by region of England. We can see that, for example, while in the Northeast, average wealth per person 
is £150,000, um, with a bit over half of that being held in the form of housing wealth. In London, wealth per person on average is almost half a million pounds. And that big difference in assets is going to feed through to a different amount of exposure to the effects of this amendment across different regions. So here in this chart, I'm showing the effect of the amendment in terms of the additional amount of assets that people might have to pay, uh, or would have to pay under these different care scenarios by English region. So we're seeing that, for example, um, if those in the Northeast were to go and spend 10 years in residential care, this would require them to contribute an additional 60% uh, of their assets as a result of the amendment. Uh, that compares to um, about 1% for those in London, so a significantly larger impact on those in the Northeast. Looking across some of the scenarios, we see also um, effects in line with that in terms of the, the gradient across regions. One exception is for the shorter care journey, where those who are um, in higher wealth parts of the country are slightly more affected. The reason for that is that we're taking into account also differences in average costs across regions of England. And it's those in the South and in London where costs are higher, who would actually be able to hit the cap in under one of these kind of shorter care journeys and who are therefore able to be affected by the amendment and affected slightly more. But for the, for the longer journeys, what really matters is who has these kind of moderate levels of wealth and that's more common um, in the Northeast, in Yorkshire and in the Midlands. So just to summarize then, this, the new cap and the expansion of the means test, means tested support has substantially increased pr protection against care cost risk at older ages. And just to remind ourselves, all people will be more protected even with the proposed amendment as a result of this uh, full, full package of reforms. However, the bit that we are focusing on today, the government's proposed amendment would reduce that degree of protection against long and costly journeys, particularly for those with moderate income and assets. And we've seen that it's those with, uh, who are in the second wealth quintile of the older population with assets per person of between 83 and 183,000 pounds who are most affected. It's also important to note that those with higher amounts of assets can still be affected um, if they have a journey that combines a period of domiciliary care followed by residential care. The differences in the effect, depending on your level of wealth, translate into different impacts across regions and mean that those in the Northeast, Yorkshire and the Humber and the Midlands uh, would be more affected in terms of reduction in their protection against high costs as a result of the amendment than would those in the south of England. So that I'm going to stop there and now I'm going to hand over to Andrew Dillnott who's going to give the first of our responses. Uh, David thank you and thank you Charles and Anita too. I, I think this is a really great and important piece of work and I'm really grateful to have the chance to talk about it. I'll be as brief as I can. <clears throat> I think there are three areas that I just wanted to talk about a little bit. The first is the working age. Uh, both David and Charles have already spoken about this. One way of uh, construing what, what Charles and David have shown us is that the impact of this amendment is going to be particularly heavily felt by people with long care journeys and with relatively moderate incomes and assets. And in the analysis that, that David and Charles have shown us, we've been looking at that in the context of older people. That's an even more significant effect for those of working age, because the nature of uh, the kind of needs that somebody who enters working age or has, has needs established early in working age is that they are going to have a long care journey. Uh, or we certainly hope they're going to have a long care journey unless their care needs are resolved. And so for those of working age, this amendment seems likely to be uh, particularly significant, very greatly reducing the probability that they will reach the cap soon or possibly at all. So, so although we don't have data that enables us to do the same kind of analysis that, that uh, 
David just shown us for those of working age, and that's that's a story all of its own. The lack of good data in the social care space reflects other ways in which social care is, I think, somewhat hard done by. But but it really is the case that we should have in our minds that this amendment, if it goes through, will have a very heavy effect on those of working age and greatly reduces the probability that they are effectively protected from catastrophic costs. That's the first point I wanted to make. The second, and this was something that I really, really appreciated in this piece of work, is information about the distribution of income, the distribution of wealth, and indeed the regional distribution of those things for the older population. And the information that, that David put up uh, may not be a surprise to, to those on the call, but it's just, I think, a powerful reminder that uh, the incomes and wealth uh, asset holdings of older people are lower than many parts of the policy debate seem to imply. So, to, so David showed us that 80% uh, of those with uh, problems with one activity of daily living have got incomes of less than £22,500 a year and assets of less than 380, that 60% have got assets of less than 219,000, which is only just above the threshold at which you're not affected by these changes. So these changes, which may seem as though they're only affecting people on uh, pretty strikingly low levels of income, well, they're actually affecting a very large group amongst the elderly population that might be uh, exposed to social care needs and on top of those figures which were nationwide the reminder of the regional uh, variation in income and wealth particularly wealth is critical as david or charles I can't remember which it was said early on one way of thinking about the arguments that were in our mind when we first suggested a cap was was that we thought there should be social insurance against uh, social care need. This was something where it made sense to pool the risks across the population as a whole. And one way of thinking about what the cap is, is that it's the excess in a social insurance policy. It's the, the amount that individuals are left to manage with for themselves. Now, as Charles pointed out, our original suggestion for the level of the cap was that it should be in, in current prices or in 2023 prices about £50,000. If the cap, that excess, were set at £50,000, then uh, even in parts of the country with lower levels of wealth and house prices than those we see at the moment, you'd still be providing a, a reasonable amount of protection. With a cap set at £86,000, the importance of the interaction between the means test and the cap that we advocated in the Commission that has been legislated for is significantly enhanced. The way that interaction worked by counting uh, the state's contribution as part of the metering towards the cap effectively meant that the cap was lower for people on less high levels of income and wealth than it was for the better off. It was a way of introducing progressivity into the system, and I do think that was critical. Uh, the figures that, that David show make it clear that the idea that we should say to uh, people, oh, save up enough just in case you're one of the unlucky ones, is for most older people, uh, it's something they simply couldn't do because if they ended up in the tail of the social care need distribution, more than all of they'd accumulated would be taken away. The third area I just want to talk about is how we should think about uh, the state's involvement here, and in particular, the interaction between the means test and the cap. We have means testing in many parts of our social welfare provision because we want to uh, provide more support to those on low levels of income and wealth than to the rest of the population. That would be delivered by uh, our original Commission proposals and by the 2014 Care Act. It wouldn't be delivered if this amendment goes through. For somebody with a short care journey, the state would be more generous to somebody with low levels of income and wealth than to somebody who uh, was better off. But if that person on low level of income or wealth has a long care journey, she could end up using, would end up using exactly the same amount of her own money as her better off counterpart who had the same care need. That seems to me to fly in the face of 
uh, our notions of progressivity and why we have a means tested system. We have a means tested system to help those most in need. This amendment would mean that you'd be helped relative to your better off counterparts if you had a relatively short care journey. But if you're less fortunate, you end up with a long care journey, social care need for longer, you end up spending exactly the same amount of your own resources as the better off person. That doesn't seem to me to be the right thing. Let me finish there, but finish with, with a brief reflection on what we're doing in social care at all. We have an extensive welfare state in this country and in much of the world now, and, and we use our welfare states to uh, protect those who are not able to protect themselves. That's a strong argument for means testing. It can also be a strong argument for broader social insurance, where we think that individuals are not easily able to pool risks themselves. That's why we should be doing something in the area of social care. And it's hard to imagine an area where that's not more vital to the functioning of a good society. We want as a society surely to make sure that we are uh, looking after those who are unable to look after themselves and enabling all of us to uh, make appropriate planning and provision. The, the area of social care is one that is far too invisible. We pay too little attention to it. Uh, many of those who talk about it only, only become aware of it once they have a social care need in their own extended household. We don't see as much discussion of it as I wish we could in the wider media, in policy. And that's something that I hope can get better. The changes that we're looking at today deserve the kind of analysis that they've been given because appropriate provision, adequate provision of social care is, I think, a good benchmark of how well we're doing as a society. And, and my own sense is that the, uh, the amendment that we're looking at uh, would, would raise significant savings for the system as a whole, but would raise those savings from a group uh, towards the lower part of the income and wealth distribution and on average in less well off parts of the country. Now, those are judgments that, that politicians sometimes may feel they have to make, but I think we need to look them very plainly in the eye. And that's why I think this piece of work is so helpful. And on that note, let me stop and hand over to Anna. Anna. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to build really on what Andrew said and just broaden out and make some general observations. Um, as Anita said when she introduced me, I'm currently chairing a commission on behalf of the Archbishops of Canterbury and York to reimagine care. So we're challenged to think quite big and quite, quite radical. And part of this has been listening to people who draw on care and uh, their carers and people who work in, in social care. And I think it's just important as we sort of focus on this quite technical policy amendment, just to remind ourselves what we're talking about when we say social care. And in the commission, along with others like Social Care Futures, we're very much thinking about care and support as an enabler to help us live our lives, to live a meaningful life, a purposeful life, or in the values that we've suggested to flourish you know, to live a full uh, life. And yes, that means practical help. It means sometimes very personal care, but it means a whole range of things that enable us to participate fully, <clears throat> whether that be in work, in play, um, in worship, if, if one has a faith. So we have put together some principles and values, and, and one of those is also universal. And I think this comes you know, perhaps to something Andrew was saying about why is this so invisible and why do we still, as a, um, you know, rich society, uh, not provide uh, care for people? Caring affects us all at some point in our lives, either as uh, needing uh, to receive some care and support or giving uh, care and support. And I think it's that universality that we really need to think about when we're thinking about these policy questions and technical questions about how do we fund care. So I think that's the first general observation. Let's just remember uh, what we're talking about here, why it's so important and why we should perhaps value it more as a society. And perhaps that means part of valuing care 
also means um, perhaps funding it more generously. The second general observation I'd make is how this policy issue has been framed by successive governments. And it's been framed, this sort of fixing social care, as trying to sort out a problem that's defined as people having to sell their homes uh, to pay for care. And as we've seen, this sort of way of framing the, the policy question has led us to some very particular, not to say not important, but some very particular uh, policy solutions. For a start, it seems to assume that, you know, everybody owns their own home. Well, amongst current uh, pensioners, uh, there is a high rate of home ownership, somewhere around 79%. That's changing rapidly, however, and the future generations uh, age, we can expect to see a very significant rise in rental accommodation and indeed in private rental accommodation. So this is not necessarily going to be a long term sustainable way of funding social care into the future if we sort of continue to rely on people's uh, personal wealth to fund it. It also you know, makes some assumptions, I think, about um, how many people are actually going to have catastrophic care. And of course, that one in seven of people over age 65 that is quoted as, as needing lifetime costs over 100,000, of course, is not insignificant, you know, one in seven. Um, and so some form of protection against those catastrophic costs certainly um, you know, is something to consider as one of the many sort of policy choices that uh, government could, could look at. The other, of course, is to remember that our current means tested system and the current uh, draw on wealth doesn't just affect uh, wealthy homeowners, as we've seen uh, that spend down at the moment to as little as £23,000 um, does mean that even people with um, sort of moderate uh, housing equity and housing assets have been affected. So, you know, this system is going to um, um, help people. But I feel this framing, this policy framing of how can we stop people having to sell their homes? And this analysis we've seen today is sort of who's going to have more of their assets taken away uh, with this um, latest amendment is really the wrong question. And we should be asking a much more fundamental question as a society, given that this is a universal experience, given the importance of care, how can we ensure that we get the right care and support that we need when we need it? So I think that would just be my sort of second observation. I suppose the third observation really is that, you know, Andrew was obviously asked to do his report, uh, you know, more than 10 years ago now. And the state of social care at the time was very different. And so, again, in terms of, you know, what are our policy priorities? I think that what's happened to social care over the past decade suggests that maybe uh, this is this isn't the priority for um, for government funding. We've had a decade of austerity. We've seen cuts in local authority funding, different estimates, but about a 55 percent reduction in their budgets. That's obviously fed through into tightening eligibility criteria based on need. So only the people now with really high levels of need are getting any care. Uh, we're seeing fewer recipients. As uh, Charles showed at the beginning, while funding levels, you know, have sort of uh, uh, improved again, they've only taken us back even in, in real terms to the 2010, 2011 levels. And if you look at it per person, as Charles showed, um, it's actually a spending reduction. The other one that I don't think has been commented on is the fact that that means tested threshold hasn't changed with inflation. Uh, so effectively more and more people have been uh, excluded from receiving any uh, state funded support and nor has the minimum income guarantee for disabled people. So we're, we're faced with a very, very different um, sort of situation in terms of social care. You can add to that, obviously, you know, Brexit, the challenges to the workforce. We had a 7% of the workforce were um, estimated to come from EU uh, migrants. Um, obviously, Brexit and our immigration policies have severely affected uh, the ability to um, workforce, retain the workforce. Uh, there were even before the pandemic 7% vacancy levels in this. We know the issues of low pay, even with the national living wage. This is a sector that has not kept up with other very low paid um, jobs. And then add to that the pandemic. 
uh, obviously low occupancy rates, homes having been closed to admissions, uh, care being withdrawn from uh, families, uh, whether that was day centres, uh, respite care, uh, and indeed some domiciliary care. That led to a greater burden on family carers. Uh, carers UK have suggested that four and a half million people became uh, took on uh, unpaid caring responsibilities during the pandemic. So we face many, many challenges. And I suppose faced with that, the question is, does capping the catastrophic care and with this amendment uh, providing, you know, a high degree of financial protection, perhaps slightly more to those on higher incomes and with more assets and uh, less to those with moderate, uh, the priority for any additional funding that we can raise, for example, through the national insurance uh, increase. And I think, you know, there's different estimates of sort of what's needed. I think uh, the Health Foundation, um, 1.9 billion was just to meet current demand. And that's before you address any of the other issues that I've mentioned of sort of unmet need, paying the workforce uh, better, providing respite and support to unpaid carers. So in looking at these specific analysis and congratulations, you know, for having done this analysis, it's incredibly important that, as policymakers, uh, those in the Lords and Parliament scrutinise these amendments, they understand those differential impacts, both by geography, socioeconomic, uh, and so on. And it's really fantastic that you've looked into that. But I think we need to remind ourselves that even what's on the table, yes, it may be providing some greater degree of um, financial protection, it does meet that aim. But in terms of the real issues, um, the opportunity for people of all ages living with disability to live a full life. And that's really why I'm so passionate about the work of the Archbishop's Commission on Reimagining Care, that really, um, you know, ensuring against that risk of needing care in future, that risk of very catastrophic care, it is important, but there are many millions of people who are getting little if no care. Uh, we're short of carers. We've got exhausted family carers and we've got providers um, who you know, are struggling financially. So I think um, we need to put this debate into that context and make sure that policymakers uh, and as a society, we are actually addressing the big question about how do we care and how do we fund better care for everybody? Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for um, great presentations and contributions. Uh, uh, really useful. I'm, go I'm going to start picking up a little bit from some of the remarks that, that Alice, we've got some uh, questions in the Slido asking about how all these reforms will affect the six out of seven people who don't affect who don't face catastrophic costs. Um, and also, will this package of reforms mean that actually we face increased demand for social care and services which are already under immense pressure, as Anna described, feel um, even more overwhelmed? Um, I don't know, I might be unfair and ask Charles. Okay, thanks Anita. I'm sure everyone else will have a view on this, these questions as well. Um, on the first one, I think, I mean, I my answer to that would be just like any other form of insurance. It's not just those who get a payout who benefit. Um, you know, so one in a hundred of us might draw on our car insurance a year, but of course, we're not, the other ninety nine who don't draw on it will benefit as well. So, yes, it's true that um, only perhaps those people who face costs of more than eighty six thousand will get a kind of payout um everyone has experienced the peace of mind benefits and i do think that there is a just thinking reflecting on what anna's saying as well i think there are you know i think that these changes could actually make the care market for example function better i think it's you know quite a lot of the problems about um people's disengagement people's um perhaps lack of investment in their quality of life and and um well-being is perhaps to do with the system. The other thing I would say just on that is that, of course, the extent, the means test improvements also do mean that actually a substantially greater number of people actually do financially um, benefit. Um, the second question was about demand, I think, wasn't it? What would it do? So um, I think 
it could well increase some demand to some, to some extent, as in there may well some, be some people who aren't getting care because they are worried about the cost, they'll delay it for as long as possible, who may well come forward to their local authorities um, and, and get um, asked to be kind of have their care costs counted towards the cap. Um, however, it will be some time before they actually get that, um, that care provided by the state. So I, I, the other thing is that local authority eligibility thresholds are very high and too high at the moment. So actually you do need to be in a pretty, pretty needy of care to actually um, be eligible for having your cost count, cost count towards the cap. So I think, yes, it could, but I don't think it's, a, I actually don't think it's gonna be a major impact. Should I come back in on the six out of seven? Cause I guess I, I raised that specter. I'm, I'm sure that Andrew will also want to, to add to this. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, there are other things that would have a bigger impact, for example, relaxing some of those eligibility criteria. So I think the fact that we have the needs um, sort of criteria are now so tight that actually that is, is having a massive impact on a lot of people who are either foregoing care and support um, because uh, they're not going to pay for those lower or intermediate care. And really that does then mean that people inevitably will get worse, deteriorate and escalate into crisis. So I think that in terms of um, what could have a bigger impact on those six out of seven, well, indeed it would have an impact on everybody uh, would, who, who needed care of any sort would be um, to, have, to have more generous eligibility criteria. Um, I mean, I, as I say, there are other things that were in Andrew's original proposals that I think would also, uh, you know, do perhaps more for more people. Um, so, for example, the zero rating for disabled adults under age 40. Um, you know, in some ways, I would like us to see our parliament debating, reinstating some of these more radical amendments uh, that I think um, could really, really help people uh, rather than in a way going backwards with this um, particular means tested uh, amendment. Um, I think it's really important in this area to be clear that uh, no one has ever, I think, suggested that risk falling further non means tested population is the Sing, is, is a single solution. It's part of a family of solutions. And there's no doubt that at the moment we have an absolutely critical need for an increased level of funding for the means tested system. The existing means tested system uh, critically needs more money. It needs more money because the eligibility criteria have become so stringent in some areas as to be, uh, well, I'll try not to use unparliamentary language. Um, that many people looking at them would think they were unfair, that we were excluding people from care who desperately needed. So I think that that's an extremely important thing. And as I began my remarks by saying, I think we need to look more closely at the working age. I think a critical part of our original, our original recommendations was indeed setting the cap at zero for those of uh, with pre-existing needs once they enter working age. But I also think it's important to realize that increasing funding for the means test will not provide better care for everybody because there, there is a significant group that's excluded from the means test. And those people who are excluded from means tested support are not certainly under the current regime or even under the reform regime, only people who we would look at and think we're extremely well off. There are many people who are not at all well off, but are excluded from the means test. And in terms of how we frame this, I, I also, I strongly uh, don't want to see this framed as this is all about protecting people's family homes. That's not what it's about at all. The idea of ensuring against catastrophic risk is to encourage consumption, not discourage it. Uh, indeed, one of the best effects you possibly get from the sort of system we've been advocating is that, is that bequests would be smaller, not bigger, because people would spend their money on looking after themselves before they died, rather than keeping it in reserve just in case they happen to be in the tail end of the distribution. So I don't think these things are in any way in conflict with one another. We need more funding into the means tested system, but we also desperately need appropriate risk pooling for social care for everybody, 
this amendment, if it goes through, will radically reduce the extent of risk pooling for the less well off who aren't entirely covered by the means tested system. Thank you. <clears throat> the, there's a, a series of questions as well in Slido, which are, if you like, thinking about um, some of the leakier aspects of reform. I guess one of the things that we've seen uh, since uh, 2008, at least, is um, a, a, a quiet drip drip erosion of access and quality, yeah? And so obviously the reforms here make some improvements, but I guess one of the things that people are worried about is where are the risk points in this in the, the system that's being put in place where we'll actually be able to see progressive erosion. So we're interested very much in the extent to which the standardization of, of the assessment of need um, happens in the extent to which daily living costs, top-ups, all these things are, are regulated. I might um, ask David to come on the, in on this at the beginning, thinking in particular, um, and thinking in particular about IFS, you were able to do this analysis because of um, the ELSA survey. And as we said repeatedly, we don't have as detailed an assessment for under uh, 65s because we don't have the data. Um, one of the things that legislation is trying to uh, 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 do is to improve um, data in social care. So um, from having done this analysis, thinking about the risks of the sort of drip drip of further erosion, are there some things you'd really want to see you know, tracked in the, it going forward in social care to make sure that the intent to improve does result in real improvements for people? Thanks. Yes. Well. Yeah, certainly. So, so quickly, I think top of my list, really, um, where I would be more information about who's using care, how long are they spending in care, what are their care journeys looking like, um, and how is that associated with other characteristics? So as you kind of saw today, we had information on people's wealth and incomes. So that's one part of the picture. But we had to kind of say, you know, some illustrative things about what kind of care they might face. We've got some bits and pieces, some of it now quite out of date, a decade old, um, in terms of data on how long people tend to stay in residential care once they've entered care homes. Um, but there's a lot more that we would want to know, updating that, knowing how care use varies with people's other, other characteristics, allowing us to get more of a handle on um, the use of care of people um, of working age as well and their financial situation and wider circumstances. So definitely some you know new survey information or even just something to get at kind of the use of care in the population and how that's associated with other characteristics, I think is really key. Thank you. I'm conscious of time, so I'm afraid we're at the end. So I'll need to um, bring this to a close. One of the questions in Slido was, is it all too late for change this? No, the answer is not. It's going through the Lords um, at the moment. But I guess the most important thing is, you know, this, as Anna has said, Andrew has said, and everyone actually working on this has said, this funding reform is part of the jigsaw. It's one piece, but it is not solving the social care problem. The, there is a white paper as well, reform agenda that some modest improvements, but actually we need to start now as we recover from the pandemic where social care has been hit more than any other sector, I think really, to reimagine social care. So I encourage you both to, um, to engage in the debate on funding reform, but also if you have great ideas for reimagining social care, do send them to Anna's commission, which I think the consultation is still, still out. Think big and think bold. And also, you know, let's try and make sure that data and transparency improves because, you know, 12 billion, 10 billion pounds, I think it is, is going into tackling the NHS waiting list. Sajid Javid has confirmed today. Part of the reason why that's happened is because we know there are 6 million people waiting and it's very visible. 
Yeah, a lot of the impact of the decisions on social care is hidden from view. And until it's more visible, it will be hard to really galvanise reform. All the stuff David was talking about might sound techie. Actually making this visible, making this real really matters. So thank you to Charles and David for making part of the policy making more visible. It's really important and enjoy your day. Yeah.